I firmly intend to promote its delivery and availability of debt advice for all EU citizens. These kind of tools, debt experts can more easily and faster identify some features the project is helpful because it gives concrete ideas on what is meant by financial literacy. Our experiences show that debt management is, um, is very important, that people are not evicted and that they don't become homeless. When people have a debt in the utility services, that there is obligation for the authorities to apply debt advice. In the end of the day, it's also to make sure that the citizens, just the clients who get help, know that they can rely and trust in the help they get. To the car, we have uh, about uh, 14, 15 uh, confidence with uh, creditors uh, about quick arrangements uh, between debtors and creditors. developed a way of measuring the repayment capacity of people, which is accepted both by creditors and debtors, which is quite unique. Financial vulnerability detection mechanism and measures adopted in France. How can you set up an intervention and improve your intervention to help people to uh, stay out of debt? Good morning, my name is Willem Pieter de Groen and I would like to welcome you on behalf of project partner SEPS and VVA as well as the European Commission which initiated and commissioned the, this seminar series to the third and final seminar in the seminar series on good practice in debt advice. Of course, today we will, will again have three new good practices that will be presented and discussed in the focus group uh, as well as at the end of the, today's uh, seminar we'll have uh, a speech by Niels Berendt, director at DG Just. As you might have seen today, we also have uh, interpretation. So if you want to follow the entire meeting in English, I kindly ask you to press interpretation and then select English and you will have the entire meeting in English. Otherwise you have the second presentation uh, in French. So interpretation and then English. I will remind you also just before we have the uh, second presentation. But we start with the first presentation of uh, good practice uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, for, there, Ian Vliegendhart of the Dutch National Institute of, for Family Finance Information, or NIBUT, will present the first good practice on living wage calculation institutes and their tools to determine the living wage. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Willem-Pieter. And good morning from, uh, from Amsterdam. 
We're very happy to uh, to be here with you. And I saw uh, greetings from all cities of Europe coming in. So we have a, a broadly and lively audience. So I'm very happy to present something about the way we work in the Netherlands with regard to realistic uh, repayments capacities. And before I go into the practice of the Netherlands, I want to say a few things about how indebtedness in the Netherlands actually works. Ne next slide, please. Um, one of the uh, major issues that we face as a, uh, as a society with regard to debts is that small repayment problems lead to over indebtedness. And that has all kinds of societal, but also uh, uh, personal repercussions for those who are in debt. Uh, additional cost of debt collection is something which is adds to the uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, amount that people have to repay, as well as that it has very deep impact upon personal lives. When your ways is seizured or when you are in, uh, unable to make up your own budget due to stress and other circumstances. So what we see is that there is often an idea that people can repay more than they actually can, uh, which leads to rep repayment schemes that in the end cannot be held uh, and which then return to a loss both for the debtor and, and creditor. So what we seek to establish with, with Niebert is that we have come up with a method which is both accepted by debtors and creditors uh, and, come, uh, and delivers a scheme which on the one hand allows debtors to have uh, a living condition which enables them to repay their uh, debts without going under the social minimum and which also gives creditors the idea that they are being repaid up to the most viable amount of money that you can actually expect. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and if we look at, at the, the context of the Netherlands, we are dealing with what we know is the top of the iceberg. Many of uh, people who are indebted or suffer uh, payment uh, problems, we do not know. 8,800,000 people have light payment problems and amount, about, about the same amount of people actually have severe payment problems. On the other hand, we only see a little over 100,000 people every year. And that with we, we, I mean all the Dutch institutions that actually deal with uh, debts and, and repayment capacity. So we, we are well aware of the fact that we are dealing with a problem that is largely underwater. And I think that is a thing that is also a, a topic which is also very lively discussed in, in, in other European parts. We do not know who the debtors are until the problems have become as big as unsolvable. And that is something which we seek to address most actively within our work um, to make sure that people seek help in an early stage, because in an early stage, there are more arrangements to be made. But we have a large task ahead of us. If you look at this, at this iceberg. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, we, uh, and in this presentation, we I will be discussing NIBUT. And NIBUT is a Dutch National Institute for Family Finance, which now a little over 40 years gives budget advice to all Dutch citizens. And we do that from, from a very large range of topics. We provide advice to ministries and institutions on what a viable uh, lending uh, uh, system could look like. But we also give direct advice to consumers, ranging on, let's say, references to what other people spend on certain things in life. Uh, but also we give uh, advice on pocket money for children, which is still our most popular uh, page on our website, which is visited over uh, almost 6 million a year. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit about how we are uh, uh, funded. Because in many st states, um, institutions like NIBUT are either uh, a charity or public, publicly funded. And we have a mixture of that in a sense that we have two large subsidies, which amount for about 25% of our uh, um, costs. Uh, and half of them is given by the uh, Ministry of Social Affairs in the Netherlands. And the other one comes from a corporate of financial institutions. But for the most part, we finance ourselves by selling our information 
uh, either directly to consumers or to institutions that then provide them to consumers. We give advice to governments and private parties in the Netherlands. And we're part of a, a, a set of education schemes that also allows us to do what we, what we do. We have about 45 em employees. And what we are very proud of, we are known by 90% of the Dutch society due to a recent opinion poll that we, that we held. Um, and that gives us a very strong position in, in, in advising uh, both the public, but also uh, the, the institutions on what a good arrangement for uh, debt prepayment could look like. And I will want to talk to you about that in the coming 10 to 15 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, we work in, in, in different domains in which we will touch upon uh, within this presentation. We work on budgeting uh, and reference budgets but we also work via uh, advice via websites and national and local agencies. We make both credit and mortgage norms. And what we also stress is the, uh, the, the issue of saving for your retirement uh, and a long-term perspective for people actually to uphold their uh, uh, way of living. And that is something which we come across as a very prominent and also pressing topic right now. Uh, we know that especially people who suffer shortages uh, have difficulties with planning for the, for the longer term. So we have extra interest in pursuing also a way of living uh, amongst Dutch citizens that also makes sure that when they retire, they have enough to live from. Next, next slide, please. But I won't go into that. Uh, that, uh, that discussion, I will focus today on how we come up with realistic repayment schemes. And I think there are two uh, issues which are important to stress on the uh, foreset. First is that realistic payment uh, schemes, it si sounds si simple, but it's hard to accomplish, should not worsen the household situation. And by that, we mean that if people go into a repayment scheme, it must be durable in the sense that they are able to maintain their repayments from start to end. And I think that is both for creditors and debtors an important signal that this scheme actually works and that everybody knows that at the end, everyone has fulfilled their uh, obligations and people can start off with their new lives. And secondly, I think it's important that we work on early signaling, uh, uh, especially because early signaling also enlarges the opportunities that we have to come up with creative uh, solutions. And we know that uh, if we early are able to, to signal the early that full repayment is not possible, we're able to give better advice. Um, and I think that is something which are two building blocks of uh, what we think is a good system of uh, uh, building repayment schemes. So you have to deal with the particularities of the people who are in debt and have to repay, but also you have to work very vigorously on early signaling because early signaling is probably one of the most decisive ingredients, whether a scheme works or, or not. Secondly, um, we are used uh, uh, for credit worthiness assessments in the, um, uh, in, the, in the way which banks actually assess people whether they're giving credit or not. And I think that is something of preventive way of working to make sure that people who cannot repay their debts will not get into, uh, can into debts. And sec uh, thirdly, what we seek to establish is an easy to use scheme that everyone understands and individual consumers can actually look into and also know how it works. And finally, we wanted to come up with a system which is trusted, both by creditors and debtors, so that it's something that people actually turn to uh, and say, well, if Nibet advises this repayment scheme, we better live up to it bo on both sides of the aisle. Next slide, please. Um, and what, 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 how do we do that? Uh, and I think that the most important thing is publicity. And thirdly, uh, firstly, there is a minimum basket of goods and services. That is a basket that everyone needs, needs and that people actually should still have also when they repay their debts to maintain their 
minimum living. Uh, and I think that's an important thing that we establish that on reference budget. So we do not do that on personal uh, characteristics, but rather on large uh, uh, data of how much people spend on uh, different issues. And that is something which is, constitutes the first layer of measuring how much people actually can repay. And the more you earn, the more there's, uh, uh, there's left to repay. But we not, not only start from a minimum basket, what we also add to the equation is personally unavoidable spendings. And you can think of high rents of mortgages or special situations in which people live in, medical uh, care that they have to uh, have in order to maintain their normal life. And we add that to what people actually need to spend. And that increases also the durability of the scheme. And it also caters to a certain more specific way of coming up with a amount of money that people can repay, which is more realistic. Uh, and thirdly, uh, which is something which is rather discussed every now and again, but we still have that in the equation because we think it's important. And it also strengthens the durability of the repayment scheme. We have an income dependent necessity in a sense that we are well aware that if you earn more than a minimum wage, and you have to, your life is probably also based on that income and people are not able to cut their expenditures immediately to a minimum. So to taking that into account uh, also allows us to come up with a more durable repayment scheme in which people also have a little bit more room to, to maneuver. Um, so whereas the first uh, uh, indicator is something of an objective for a fit, one size fits all uh, uh, approach, and the addition of personal and avoidable costs and the income dependent necessity also gives it a more catered and personal characteristics, which uh, strengthens the way in which actually people are able to maintain their uh, repayment um, uh, schemes throughout the years. And finally, one of the things that we have to comment upon is that the social minimum is not equal to affordable. So we take seriously into account how households actually look like. And we, know, we are well aware that if you are a couple with three children, you cannot live on what is established as a social minimum for an individual. So in that respect, we also look at household characteristics to make sure that we have a good equation where both predators and debtors are able to maintain their obligations. Next slide, please. Um, and this is how it looks in practice. So what, what we see is that uh, we have different lines. And I think it's important to look at the line of the norm spending, which is the one with the larger uh, dots. Um, where we, where we find, what we find is that people are able, when their income increases, to repay more of their debts. But at the same time, because their standard of living is higher, a, a repayment capacity both when, the, uh, when, when, when lendings are problematic, but also when they are unproblematic, has to deal with the fact that people with larger wages have other ways of expenditures. And there you see how we measure repayment capacities. And we do this both for personal loans as well as for mortgages. Uh, and the way we do it in mortgages is every year uh, founded into the Dutch regulations on which bank have to base their practices. So that's also something which has a preventive way of measuring. When it comes to loans, banks are also obl obliged to assess the uh, credit worthiness along the lines that we have presented. So in, uh, that we know that if people have a larger income, the, the larger income can not only go out away via uh, repaying your debts, but also have to allow for more personal ways of living, uh, which then endure and, uh, and stay, endures the way in which these systems can actually work. Next slide, please. Um, and we have come up with a, a tool uh, quite recently that calculates the repayment capacity and people can fill them in for themselves, but they can also fill them in with uh, financial advisors or banks. And it calculates the financial room for a monthly repayment based on income and the other characteristics that I just mentioned. 
And this tool is made to help debt collectors and debt advisors to make a realistic estimate of the repayment capacity of a, of a household. Uh, and I think that by doing so, we give a transparent way of calculating it, which then also can be measured and tested by other parties than NIBIT alone, which enhances the, the trust people can have in such a uh, uh, calculator. Next slide, please. I will take you shortly through it. And unfortunately, we only have it in Dutch. So you have to go to the, uh, you have to uh, uh, go, go to the Dutch words, but we, we ask all kinds of uh, questions ranging from, from age, whether you live together with a partner, whether you have children, uh, whether, you, whether you have certain uh, uh, payments that you have to make monthly, uh, whether you have other loans that you have to repay, repay and then we come up with a, a, a capacity to repay, which is durable uh, 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 throughout the entire, the entire scheme. Next slide, please. Uh, and that relates to the expenditures that people have for living, how the costs of feeding, healthcare, but also traveling to work uh, or for social events. Um, so that it actually fits into the entire expenditure scheme that people have and that they have to able to maintain for several years. Next slide, please. Um, and we have a, a few things for the future on which we are working now. Uh, we all know that throughout European regulation, PSD2 is now becoming an increasing uh, um, feature in the way in which banking will develop. And what we seek to unlock is, unlock is the way in which we can actually use that system to come up with more specific and more personally catered ways in, people, uh, in measuring how people actually spend their money and what a real and a realistic repayment capacity is. And we do that in a very volatile circumstance. And I want to uh, uh, finish off with a few words on what we think is now coming towards us. The COVID-19 crisis, at least in the Netherlands, is giving all kinds of problems for economic viability of households. And we see different groups that are getting into additional problems. Young people are suffering more in financial terms and in economic terms than older groups. And that's somewhat of an irony because we know that young people are uh, in, in, in medical terms more viable to survive this, uh, this virus. We also see that flexible workers in the Netherlands suffer more than people who have fixed contracts. And self-employed people are also uh, suffering more than people who have, have, have work. Um, and what we see is that especially these groups are very hard to point, pinpoint down in repayment schemes because they have flexible incomes. Uh, so we do not know what they earn in two or three years. And if you come up with schemes, then you have to have a certain amount of certainty, but also a certain amount of conservatism on uh, what the capacity will be in the future. And I think that there, I think technology can help us. And if we know how they, people spend their money, we know that in the end, they are able to come up with more specifically catered schemes that strengthens both the durability, but also the trustworthiness of what we do. And with that slide, I wanted to end my presentation. I'd rather give it back to you, uh, Willem Pieter. Thanks a lot from Amsterdam. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, for... Uh briefly presenting uh, Nibit and, and the tools and I expect that you have much more to tell about all the tools and how you also in, in practice determine uh, the, the living wage. Uh, so uh, I invite everyone also to join the first focus group uh, today where the colleague uh, of Ayan Marcel Warnar uh, will um, discuss with you uh, the uh, living wage uh, calculation institute as well as the tools. If you want to join uh, Marcel um, in this focus group, please indicate that in the chat uh, to host uh, Beatrice Posso. Now we go uh, to the second practice, a good practice presentation of today. That one is delivered by Benoit Eret of the Banque de France in French. So please change interpretation English if you want to follow the presentation in English. Of course, if you want to follow the presentation in French, you don't need to do uh, anything. Um, 
so the presentation uh, from uh, Benoit will be about financial transaction based detection uh, of uh, financially vulnerable uh, individuals uh, and how that is being done in France. Benoit, the floor is yours. Benoit? Vous m'entendez you, you can go ahead. Ok, merci beaucoup. Et, euh, désolé de ne pas réaliser cette présentation directement en, en anglais, mais ce sera mieux pour tout le monde avec la, avec la traduction. Euh, donc, je, je souhaitais vous parler ce matin, effectivement, de, des dispositifs de détection euh, de, de, de la fragilité financière euh, en France. Good morning, everyone, and sorry for this slight uh, technical problem, and sorry for not speaking uh, in English. Uh, I wanted, indeed, um, to make the presentation today and focus on uh, interesting, I think, tools that we have developed uh, in France for many years, and particularly the uh, financial inclusion approach that we have, which is based first on providing support and accompanying people. We've got then uh, uh, everything that's related to uh, um, monitoring bank accounts. And then the third focus, which is where I will be uh, uh, looking at today, it's uh, detecting uh, financial vulnerability uh, through banks. Now, um, let's start with a few important dates. I told you, uh, uh, that we've been working on this for many, many years, about 40 years. So inclusion, and particularly banking inclusion, has a long uh, history. In 1984, uh, we recognized the rights that citizens have uh, to own or to open a bank account. We then started looking at uh, personal or individual over indebtedness with the law called the Nariad's Law. The big date for us, I think, is 2013, which is when the French law actually recognizes the concept of financial vulnerability. Um, and this is uh, an important notion to have uh, uh, in the law. In 2014, we uh, adopted and signed the so-called inclusive banking charter signed by uh, all banks uh, in France and also uh, by uh, the legislator. Why that charter? Because at the time we felt that banks had to be the central actor in detecting financial vulnerability. Once the concept exists in the law, where you need to basically activate it into concrete action, and we thought banks would be the best position actors to do that. Since then, uh, where well, we've refined uh, and improved uh, the concepts and the definition, and particularly uh, the definition of uh, uh, financial vulnerability. Next slide, please. Now, how do we detect financial vulnerability? We do this uh, on the basis of three criteria. And the deeper you go into implementing those criteria, the earlier you can detect uh, uh, troublesome situations. The first type of criteria uh, is what we call uh, uh, proven uh, financial vulnerability, meaning that if the criteria are met, people are de facto to be considered as financially vulnerable. Uh, one criteria there is over indebtedness. As a French citizen, if you are over indebted, you can actually submit a declaration and you're then officially recognized as uh, over indebted and you have to be treated accordingly for a certain period of time. Uh, in this case, it's going to be five years. The bank, uh, uh, any bank that you uh, uh, sort of use as an over indebted person has to treat you uh, with in a specific way, let's say. Uh, that's going to be five years. Or second criteria there, uh, we're talking about those clients that are sort of listed in uh, a, a sort of special repository uh, file. Um, people who have had a problem uh, with uh, a check uh, that's not been uh, accepted by uh, the bank due to insufficient uh, fund on the bank account or some sort of credit issue. If that happens, you're then uh, 
put on a list and you need to be considered as a fragile and proven uh, a fragile and vulnerable customer. That's the first set of criteria. The second set of criteria is what we call modular uh, vulnerability. Uh, we're talking here about criteria that are based on a threshold, but the threshold can be set by the banks. And specifically here, we'll be talking about banks using criteria related to, uh, for example, the uh, cash inflow uh, or the cash uh, outflows, expenses, or the number of incidents that you may face as a client. Again, uh, uh, insufficient uh, funds on your account leading to uh, transactions being refused will uh, trigger a flag and uh, the bank can decide that uh, if the flag is up, you treat possibly the person as uh, a vulnerable individual. These criteria are assessed on a rolling three months basis. And you look at the average number of incidents associated to a particular account to decide whether that person is indeed vulnerable. In 2020, so recently in November, and given the COVID crisis, and uh, I'm talking about the uh, crisis that will start possibly, uh, unfortunately now, if a client uh, faces five incidents over a period of a month, he or she will be considered as a vulnerable person and uh, that status will be active, I would say, uh, for three months. And after three months, the bank will decide whether he's still vulnerable or not. The third uh, type of criteria that we use is uh, beyond the two first sets of criteria that I've just presented to you. Uh, the law also allows banks to add uh, other criteria that they can freely imagine. So a bank can freely decide to uh, use a certain type of criteria, uh, but the objective there, of course, is not to make the life of people more complicated, but to more easily and perhaps earlier detect possibly uh, uh, situations of vulnerability. So that means concretely that um, a bank will look uh, and assess uh, the average cash inflow versus cash outflow, or they will uh, more rapidly react to the fact that an incident has been uh, taking place. Uh, uh, you have banks that sometimes wait uh, uh, until somebody has been uh, put on a list of vulnerable uh, clients before they act. Some will act immediately on day one, as soon as the inscription takes place. Now, all this, of course, is um, happening under the control and the monitoring uh, of the Banque de France. Uh, specifically, what was established is the so-called observatory uh, for inclusive banking. Uh, this uh, observatory, uh, OIB, is going to regularly uh, monitor what is happening. We'll also regularly collect information from uh, banks, but also credit institutions, for example. And uh, on a regular basis, it will uh, uh, request specific information about how the accounts of vulnerable peoples have been used. Um, there will be uh, a monitoring of how many incidents have taken place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the monitoring is across the board. Um, in 2020, again recently, uh, the uh, decision has been taken to work not only or not anymore uh, on a yearly uh, data collection exercise, but on two data collection exercises per year. So it's going to be, uh, let's say, a twice yearly monitoring process rather than a, a yearly situation. And I think it's necessary and indeed a, a good idea because it allows the observatory to more regularly uh, not only identify problematic situations, but also see if banks are reactive enough and deal with the problem effectively as far as they can. And maybe uh, just one addition uh, to what I just said. Uh, the Banque de France through the observatory monitors uh, the situation, uh, looking mostly at statistics and, and data. But we've also added a system based on monthly, uh, not interviews, but at least conversations with banks. 
uh, it doesn't take long, a few minutes, but we talk regularly with the banks um, to improve, I would say, the uh, way we uh, are able to monitor and assess uh, the situation. And we can more easily, uh, through these conversations, understand what's happening. Then one more word on early detection or uh, predictive detection. According uh, to the charter that I mentioned earlier, banks are now also required to start using algorithmic uh, detection systems. So they have to establish systems to um, uh, more easily and uh, more rapidly uh, identify not situations of, of actual vulnerability, but risks of vulnerability. So the bank will be asked um, to basically keep a close eye on specific situations that may uh, be early warning signals. If you know a customer has lost his job, um, that may mean he may end up being fired financially vulnerable. Uh, a divorce uh, is another weak signal that can uh, perhaps uh, uh, trigger uh, further monitoring of a specific individual's bank account. This is something that uh, we've more or less been doing. Uh, I mean, banks have been doing that uh, for some years, but we are increasing uh, uh, this approach because I think it's a good practice. And it's uh, one of uh, uh, the very, very topical and, and very useful, I think, uh, uh, systems that we have in place. Now, we can talk about this later. Shall we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, here I am actually moving to uh, how we uh, react to vulnerability. When a bank detects a customer who's fragile, uh, vulnerable, financially speaking, they have to act, they have to respond, uh, and there are obligations to the bank to respond. And how do they respond? Well, when you identify someone who's financially vulnerable, you must offer a special uh, offer to that client. Uh, that special offer has been built up uh, by the banks uh, with the participation of uh, other actors, including social actors, uh, associations. So first, that special offer is, is first and foremost a cheap price. It can't be uh, above three euros a month. That's the cost of your bank account. It also has to have, um, within the offer, uh, you have to have measures to reduce the vulnerability. Uh, in, in some cases, for example, uh, the client won't have uh, access to checks, for example. Uh, you have to have also uh, specific features. Uh, so you not only, I would say, reduce uh, the number maybe of services that you have, but you must also have the ability to a company and to support that client. So as a bank, you have to sign an agreement with associations, and with social actors. There are structures that have been established across the French territory, specific units that have the ability to meet with people uh, in financial difficulty, uh, and they help them, they advise them, uh, they explain what budgeting is, for example, uh, what are their rights, what sort of financial support or benefit they can have access to. So that goes much beyond the simple uh, I would say relationship that an individual can have with a bank, uh, but it's an obligation now, and it's part of that special offer. So uh, a reduced price, specific goals, and services that should allow people to move away from their over-indebtedness or their financial vulnerability. So that's for the special offer. Next slide is the second response uh, that you have uh, to establish as a bank, uh, and that is basically a capping of incident fees. Uh, this started in 2019, uh, some banks uh, first, and then uh, it's now uh, uh, across the board. So basically this means if you have a vulnerable client with incidents related to a bank account, you have to cap the fees 
uh, or the penalties uh, to 25 euros per month. For those customers that have taken up the special offer I just described, the maximum is 20 per month and 200 per year. So 25 for vulnerable customers, 20 for vulnerable customers who have taken up the special offer. Uh, now, we don't have the statistics yet for 2020, but we know that for 2019, uh, the system has worked. Uh, and we've seen a decrease of 16% a year uh, to the, uh, I would say, the, the, the fees that vulnerable people have been paying, uh, which is sizable, uh, I think, when you are uh, financially in trouble already, plus 16% in terms of uh, your um, purchasing power is always good. Um, last slide, maybe. Uh, and this is an even more recent uh, initiative that has been established by the Banque de France. We have established a unit here in Paris within my team because we believe that uh, detection systems work, but there are still people that uh, somehow go unnoticed. And there are individual cases that are not detected. Uh, uh, and uh, we felt we needed to do something. So we created what we called a specific unit. Uh, and that unit is called the inclusion alert unit, not the best name maybe, but it works. Uh, the idea is that anyone who uh, may be informed about somebody being in trouble, uh, of course, if, if, if banks don't see that you are vulnerable, somebody else might, particularly an association or some sort of social support structure. Um, if someone is uh, uh, identified, uh, well, that person can be referred to the unit. Uh, we're talking here about people who sometimes end up paying 3,000 euros in incident fees and still go notice. So, uh, the idea is that the unit will trace uh, these individual cases and then they will, uh, uh, on the basis of what is happening to those individuals, try to come up with uh, possible solutions and uh, uh, make the regulatory framework uh, uh, well become even better. And I'll finish, this is my last slide, uh, with a few statistics and measures. These date back to the end of 2019. Uh, at the time, we had about 3.5 million vulnerable uh, customers in France. I expect uh, we're beyond that. We're possibly closer to 4 million now with the current crisis. Um, but 3.4 million at the end of 2019. And you can see some of the statistics. Uh, uh, the number, uh, obviously, of people who have subscribed to the special offer, uh, you can see we're uh, at 550,000 people. Uh, that's plus 57% since the end of 2019. This is good because it is uh, helpful for people. And you can see the average costs that uh, uh, people pay, uh, you know, to, to, to have a bank account. It's uh, 255 euros a year in 2019 and 151 for customers having uh, taken up the special offer. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll be talking to you in the focus group. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Benoit, for this uh, presentation of the financial transaction based uh, detection that is used in France, as well as how that is developing uh, over the years and, and continues to be uh, developing and increasingly also makes the link with, with depth advice. Um, if you want to join uh, Benoit for the focus group, you just have to stay in the plenary room uh, as there will also be interpretation uh, during the focus group uh, available. Um, so you don't have to do uh, anything for now. Um, if I see also that there are some questions, these will of course be uh, taken to the focus group for all the respective uh, uh, good practices. So uh, also that is, is, is taken care of. Um, now we move uh, back to the Netherlands where we have uh, our third good practice presentation of the day and uh, the ninth one in our series. So the last uh, presentation in the series. And that one is delivered by Tamara Madern from the Hogeschool Utrecht. 
uh, and she will present to her the good practice on design to us the good practice on design and implementation of depth advice interventions. Tamara, the floor is yours. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, for having me here. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll be talking about the design and implement depth advice uh, interventions. So this is quite another topic than the other two speakers did. It's uh, less a concrete intervention, but more how should we approach interventions. Um, so a little bit of the background. Why is this a topic that's uh, interesting and why should we be having more um, yeah, should we do more on it? Um, it's a topic I've been working on for quite a long time now. What we see in the Netherlands, and I'll, uh, I uh, guess it's also in the other countries, is a wild grow of debt-related interventions. Everyone is trying to do their best to help people. Um, but there's also a lack of knowledge on what works. Um, what we see is that scientific research is very expensive, so a lot of uh, debt counselors don't, don't ask people to um, to evaluate their intervention and just try on um, improving it themselves. There's also a very there's also some evidence that a lot of interventions don't work or don't don't do what they were expected to do. Um, maybe you all notice this study from uh, Fernandez Lynch and Nittemeyer. We find that interventions to improve financial literacy explain only. 1.0% of the variance in financial behavior studied. Um, so that's shocking. That was really shocking news to us as well. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so me and my colle colleague uh, Nadja Jungman um, took a uh, approach to this study and looked what, what have they found. And we saw that there was hope. So I will give you that uh, there's hope for the future and if you're working with this kind of interventions. Um, why is there hope? Why is there optimism? What we saw is that the objective was very, was in most interventions were very broad. So uh, they wanted to change everything and, and maybe, well, as an example, in a class of an hour, they were trying to improve uh, financial knowledge, financial competence, uh, financial behavior uh, for the next 10 years. Well, if I put it this way, you will all think, well, that's very hard to do in one hour. But it's, it's, we saw that in a lot of interventions. Also, we saw that the target group wasn't very specific. So uh, they just said, well, this intervention is for everyone. And we know you can't help everyone with one intervention. Um, we also saw that there was no or, uh, or very um, yeah, well, no um, to the timing. Sorry, I don't know how to do this better. Um, so no, th there needs to be more attention to the timing. So when are you going to uh, approach people who are having uh, difficulties? Uh, when are they open for, for help? And is there a sense of urgency? And there's also a need for uh, to be paid to the working components. Um, we see that a lot of interventions are more uh, a gut feeling of persons than that they were looking at what are the components that are working. And also if I'm trying to, uh, to take an intervention that's uh, from another country, how can I put it in our country and what are the working components and what is the context? So what should I change and what should I keep? Um, so what we thought of is that depth counselors need to be able to evaluate their interventions uh, redesign and improve them. They should do, be able to do that themselves and not only scientific research, researchers or uh, uh, bigger uh, big companies, because if they can do it themselves, we can make a difference on the working uh, uh, with the working people and then our reach will be much, much bigger. Um, so uh, there's a program in the Netherlands and if you if you translate it, it's, it's a little bit strange. It's a shoulder to the wheel, uh, schouders eronder, um, but it's actually a program to support uh, debt counselors. And what they did, they, uh, they made a, a training for debt counselors with five courses. It's a training on master level. Uh, and we did it together with other um, universities in the Netherlands. And there were five courses, behavioral insights, law, personal leadership, design and implementation of interventions and prof professional ethics and reflection. 
Um, and I was uh, responsible for the design and implementation of interventions. Um, so what we did was uh, we were we were working with the depth counselors on a plan evaluation. Um, and I know uh, normally we uh, interpreted this as a, a plan how to evaluate, but that's not the uh, case in this in this part. It's you have an intervention and then you're going to look at a plan that you have made and you're going to look at it as what can I improve on the plan? Why is this plan going to work? Uh, how can I improve it? Um, do I need to do something different? And we also uh, address the working components and the implementation plan. Just when you are ready to implement uh, a new intervention, how are you going to do that? And we saw that these three components are components that normally uh, don't get much attention. Uh, people just start and put a pilot and then they are going, uh, they are very enthusiastic. And then they say to the to the colleagues, yes, you have to do this as well, but the colleagues aren't that ent enthusiastic. So uh, the intervention doesn't work that good because the colleagues aren't doing what they were supposed to do. Um, so the plan evaluation is, um, uh, the purpose is to gain more insight into uh, to which extent the, the plan offers a solution to the problem what is it presented and can it make be plausible. Um, and in what's plan in to extent to uh, the extent to which the plan is substantiated, and uh, the extent to which existing knowledge and context have been included in the plan. So you're uh, you're really going to look at the plan and then uh, and then look at it. Can I improve it? Well, I've got an uh, example here. This is what the program has made for um, for uh, depth counselors to help them. Um, as you see, a brief introduction, a problem analysis, uh, desired situation, objective of the intervention, the target group, the context, the design, and the working components, or the theoretical base. So we really ask the people who, uh, who are doing this on, why do you think it's working? And what are your expected effects? And one of the things that we've learned from this was that people uh, write down a very broad objective or goal and then the, the working components are very narrow. And if they say the expected effects, they see on this plan, just by, by filling in the plan, I can't expect uh, the things that I want with a goal. And then you can do two things. You can expand your intervention, but in most cases that's not possible, or you can um, uh, describe your objective better. And then you see that the effectiveness goes up. Something like that. You know what I mean, I hope. Uh, next time I ask a translator as well. Um, so this was one of the, uh, the people in our course were very, um, they were very amazed by just this realization. I have to change the purpose of my intervention or the objective of my intervention. I have to make it smaller and really think what is going to make a difference in their lives. I can't, I probably can't help them to get debt free for now. But what can I do in my small intervention to help them? I maybe I, I'm be able to manage their debt in a better way to, um, to make different um, arrangements with the uh, yeah with with their uh, uh, creditors so that was one of the things that they realized by just filling in this plan um i'm going to make do to help you to make an example because it's very um uh, theoretical if i just uh, if i just tell it like this but we um we actually made a a research project in collaboration with the Wageningen University of Research and we did it ourselves uh, and we did it with a budget course and we redesigned the budget course and we did a randomized control trial. Well, this is just uh, how the uh, research was uh, was done. So we had uh, a traditional course and a new course and then we just looked at it, what does work, what works better and a group with no course at all. Um, first step was the, the analyze uh, of the traditional course, like with the plan evaluation. And what we saw is um, the only working components that were in there was helping people to get more knowledge and to um, 
get more skills. But we know from literature that more skills doesn't mean that people are going to behave different. So that was one of the, po the points that we said, hey, we have to do something about the behavior as well if we want this to work. Um, also, there was no clear target group on who are you going to do, to do this course for. So it, the course was for everyone. And uh, yeah, the goal was also very broad. Like we hope that they will um, uh, for the next 20 years have no more problems at all. Uh, so what we said is the, the goal of the course is not to help them to get out of the problems, but to know where they have to go to, to get help and to get organized. So then you get a different kind of course. Um, the second step was we improved it. So we were looking at theory and the, uh, I'm, I'm not able to go into all this theory right now, but the self-perception theory would help them uh, uh, to uh, look more at what's my role in it. But also the self-determination theory, people need autonomy, uh, they want to be related and they need to have enough competence. And we were looking in the budget course, how can we in incorporate this these elements and also we set more attention for behavior you should implement the rule of thumb and implementation intentions so this we made a new course with these elements in it um, and then we're going to well, then we had to implement it um, and we did and we thought it was very very successful uh, until we did the rct and then we saw that the uh, both courses were better than no course but we couldn't prove we couldn't see that there was a difference between the traditional course and new course. And then we were looking at what's implemented. And we saw that the rules, uh, here I go back, the rule of thumb wasn't implemented. It, uh, also, these elements were implemented, but not all the time. People found it very, very difficult. So what we did, what we did good was we made a good plan. What we didn't do, good, do very well was implement this. So we learned from this that we have to do all three of the steps. Look at the look at the project, improve the project, and really think about how can I tell the people who are working with it what are the what are the uh, important components? What should you do? What shouldn't you do? How can I help them? Um, so this is also the steps that the the, the people who um, followed the course did, but then um, with their own uh, interventions. Um, so yeah, this is a very, very small, brief course. And uh, what I want to give away for the takeaways for tomorrow, I, what I hope that you will do different if you uh, are going to work on this tomorrow is train professionals how to evaluate and improve their interventions. Help them, what are working components? Uh, what's your objective? How can you improve that? And that's the, that's the most important start. Start by addressing the objective. What do you think that you really can change in the in the time that you have? How much time do you realistic have? What can you expect from people who are really in a world of um, emotions of stress because of the of the debt problems that they are having? What can you ask of them? Cluster important working components for the professionals. So make sure that they know that they have a little uh, uh, a backpack that they can get some components out of and think, well, this, this will help in a, lot of the, uh, in a lot of the times. And pay attention to the implementation uh, because that's really a part where a lot of the working components uh, go missing. Uh, because of the context, we all say we want to do it different and in doing it different, sometimes we just lose uh, what was the good part of this uh, intervention. Um, if you have questions, you just can uh, email me on this uh, uh, email. And for now, uh, for now, I will thank you for listening, and I hope you will join us in the uh, focus group. Thank you very much, uh, Tamara, for uh, this excellent presentation of uh, interventions uh, in in depth advice. Uh, and which will be, there is much more uh, to be discussed during the focus group. We'll now also move uh, to those focus group. The procedure is slightly different than in this uh, previous two uh, seminars, as well as that this time the focus group will not be the end of the uh, seminar, but there will be a closing speech by director Niels Berndt of uh, DG Just afterwards. So uh, you are very much encouraged to also stay. So if you would like to join the first focus group on the Living Wage Calculations Institute and Tools, 
with Marcel Werner of Nibet, please indicate one in the chat. If you want to join the second focus group uh, with uh, Benoit Eret on the financial transaction bay detection, you can just stay in the plenary, so you don't need to do uh, anything. If you would like to join the third focus group with uh, Tamara Mardan on the design and implementation of debt advice interventions, then please indicate three. We'll now move uh, to the focus group. And as mentioned, after which we will all come back in the plenary for the uh, concluding remarks uh, by uh, Niels Berendt. So uh, now the focus groups will be launched and then we will be able to go to the different focus groups. So you just click join and then you will move to the focus group. And as, as mentioned, if you want to join the focus group on the financial transaction based detection, you just stay in the room, uh, the plenary room, and uh, you also have uh, interpretation from uh, French to English uh, available. So I will leave you now for the plenary room and my colleague, uh, Cynthia Alcidi, together with Roberto Musmesi, will take over the moderation and the hosting. See you soon, uh, soon towards the end of the seminar for the closing remarks. So uh, indeed, everyone is back in the uh, plenary room for the closing of this seminar series. And for this, we have the pleasure to have Niels Berndt with us. He is the director uh, for <laughs> consumers at DG Just, uh, and he will conclude the seminar series and also bring us back over or take us uh, back uh, to the different good practices that have been discussed. And afterwards, there will be still a short video wrapping up as well as looking forward when it comes to the exchange of good practices. Niels, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot and good morning to all. I hope you can hear me. I did not have the pleasure to join you for those uh, three uh, working days, but I had regular feedback from my colleagues. And I have to say, I'm, I'm uh, really impressed by the discussions uh, you had. So I'm, I'm very happy to draw the conclusions of these uh, three excellent uh, working days dedicated to exchange of best practices in the field of debt advice. Of course, you all know that our current reality is absolutely dominated by the ongoing pandemic, which first and foremost is a health crisis and requires a health response. But at the same time, the pandemic significantly impacts our economies, our societies, and all of us personally. It has affected in particular those in debt and has reduced the capacity of repayment of many debtors, often even essential uh, goods um, that you need uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, not just the luxury goods. The consequences can be detrimental to the families, the enterprises, the banks, and even for us as societies uh, more largely. To respond to this and other challenges, uh, the recently adopted new consumer agenda addresses also the situation in Europe when it comes to consumer credit and debt advice, a burning issue which is very important and very visible also for, for the council presidencies. As regards the consumer credit conditions, we are working hard to revise the consumer credit directive. Our idea is to introduce more efficient rules that take into account the real needs of the market operators and the consumers. One of the topics under discussion in this context are the current, current rules on credit worthiness assessment. We are carefully assessing whether they are still adequate for consumer protection and whether they're effective in preventing over indebtedness. To give you an idea, our conclusion is that they are not fully doing their job and uh, better rules on this are needed. On debt advice, as you see today, we are carrying out the project of which the current event is a part. This project is also composed of a study on funding of debt advice that has just been finalized and of a number of workshops for the capacity building of future debt advisors that will take place in the next months. The message is while in the mid to long term, we will have to improve the framework to come to a better resilience of consumers. We also have to address 
the urgencies, drawing on, on your expertise, on good ideas and on new tools that we could use. After the conclusion of the capacity building workshops, we plan a second event on the exchange of best practices. It will take place late uh, summer and let's hope that by then it can be organized as a physical meeting. Of course, even the current event should have been held in the form of a one day in presence workshop would have been better for a real exchange of best practices and would allow all of us to, to build stands, distribute leaflets, meet others for, for spontaneous discussions. And that's a very important element, of course, of this kind of networking. Unfortunately, this is hampered in an online environment. However, let's not just see that the downsides, there are also advantages. The, the number of participants, for example, it may be much larger. During the first day, you were about 350, I understand, and the number initially foreseen was 80. That's also a very encouraging signal of the interest that you have in this area and uh, the, the political attention that we are all giving to this very important and burning issue. In addition, online events, of course, make it easier to obtain more comments and contributions from, from, from your side, in particular through the chat line. We have collected hundreds of those contributions as they provide high quality feedback and input, which we will take forward into our next work streams. In addition, spreading the work over three working mornings has certainly facilitated a better understanding of the presentations and a more efficient organization of the discussions. I hope you also have benefited from these opportunities as much as we did. And I also hope that the results from the discussions in the last days will help our contractors to prepare the next steps in this project on debt advice. We're also preparing another initiative on debt advice. Our intention, corroborated by the results of the study on funding mentioned before, is to help the debt advisors located in countries where debt advice is not adequately provided. We want to make it easier for those countries to put in place new structures to facilitate the provision of debt advice service. As already announced by Commissioner Reinders in his opening address last week, we expect to open the first call for grant applications in the coming months. And I really encourage everybody to look out for those grants, take part in it. Our ambition is to have uh, better advice throughout the union uh, so that, that consumers, wherever they live, have a similar access to this kind of important service. Those grants should complement the results expected from this project. With the capacity building under this project, we train the trainers. And with a new grants initiative, we will help the new trainers to put in place the structures needed to carry out their tasks effectively. Our work will be significantly facilitated by the outcome of these three useful days. Therefore, let me thank you all very much again for your valuable ideas, your passionate contributions, and the time, uh, as I mentioned, the debt advice is really is a burning issue. We have to expect that it will become even more important over the next couple of weeks and months with the crisis continuing hitting uh, the financial situation of individuals and families, uh, insolvencies coming up more and more. So thanks a lot for, for your very important work. Uh, thanks for the good, uh, good uh, discussions we had. And uh, I wish you all a very nice day. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Niels. We now go over to the final video. experiences show that debt management is, uh, is very important, that people are not evicted and that they don't become homeless. 
Kurve is really helpful for debt counseling because it's practice oriented. Uh, the mentality of big companies to the persons who are uh, in debt is, uh, is changing very fast in the Netherlands. Epic rules and all these processes we have built through the years have given us an equal um, respect when we negotiate. When we can improve the skills that the debt counselors have, we can improve the life of a lot of people over a lot of years. It's very important to have a system that not only makes sure that creditors are being repaid, but also which allows debtors to start off with a new chance and a new life. There was some research done in, in May and June of last year around what the impact of COVID will have on, on debt advice. And at that point, they were expecting an increase in the requirement for debt advice of around 60%. A lot of people from all over Europe here. We've got the European Commission organising this best practice exchange, which is a fantastic uh, you know, piece of news and, and a very important uh, initiative. But um, what I'm asking is, you know, can we do something more at European level here? In September, we will be back with another seminar so discussing good practices in debt advice, also taking into account the lessons learned during the trainings. Hope to see you then. The European Commission invites debt advice applicants to participate in a series of train the trainer sessions on how to improve the quality of debt advice services for European households. The trainees should come from six member states, including Greece, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Romania, and Spain. The application process will kick off in the coming days, so stay tuned. Later this year, my services will publish a call for grants worth several hundred thousands of euros. They will aim to help potential debt advice providers in parts of Europe where debt services are needed but not sufficiently available.